So we are now playing the pre-recorded message of Dr. Dustin Moody from NIST. He has talked about uh, standardization developments at NIST in post-quantum cryptography. Can we please play it? Back in 2016, 
problem solving in this, we can see competition. And specifically, we're calling for new algorithms for our public key cryptography standards. This included two different functionalities, public key digital signatures, as well as public key encryption and public key key establishment. We saw our role as managing a process bringing the cryptographic community and the industry together in an open, transparent way um, that we would be able to select the strongest and most promising algorithms at the end of this process. We knew this would be a lot more difficult, a lot more complicated than some of the past competitions we've run, but as those have been very successful, we felt good about uh, the process. We said from the beginning there would not be just a single algorithm selected, there would be multiple choices that we would be able to select. That's for a few different reasons. Um, because you see as a relatively newer research field, we want to be able to have more than one type of security problem to base our systems on. And as the performance profiles of various of the algorithms are different, um, in different applications, some algorithms are truly better than others. So having multiple algorithms will be able to On the other hand, you know, I have too many For our selection criteria, we announced this back in 2016. The first and foremost was security. And we want these algorithms to be security as well as classical and quantum attacks. Classical we have a bit more experience with. Quantum attacks are newer, and there's not even yet a universal consensus on the best way to measure quantum attacks. With this, we define five security categories when submitters were designing their critical systems and selecting the parameters, they could try and categorize each parameter set into one of these five levels to tell us about how much security they, they thought they were providing. And then we could use those to compare different outcomes with each other. So for example, level one, we said a scheme is in level one, if it's at least as hard to break as AES-128 doing an exhaustive key search, it would take the same amount of resources to break AES-128 and to break your proposed algorithm. And we similarly defined uh, other levels all the way up to Category 5, tying it back to standardized cryptography that we already have in this new security we have a pretty good idea. So security involves a number of different um, ways to measure it. Security reductions and security proofs. The theoretical complexity, the asymptotic complexity, taking a look at the best known attacks, um, all of these sorts of things. And I would recommend that submitters provide uh, a lot of security analysis in their specification. Our second criteria was performance. How do these systems perform? on the classical platforms. Because even though they need to provide protection against quantum computers, we are still going to be running them on our, our classical architecture that we have. So how fast are they in software? How fast are they in hardware? How does the memory look? How big are the key sizes? How big are the ciphertext and the signature sizes? A lot of different benchmarks you can make. So performance, that was our second criteria. And then third, we listed a number of other properties that it would be nice to have as many of these as possible. So as much as possible, be a drop-in replacement, provide forward secrecy, be resistant to side channel attacks, be simple, be flexible, um, things like that. So our process has been going on a number of years, and we've been through three rounds of evaluation and analysis. And it kicked off in December 2017, there were 69 candidate algorithms submitted into the process. Uh, the tables there show the, the different types of families that these were based on. Uh, most of them were based on lattices or codes, but there were several other ideas as well. The missions to this uh, process came from all around the world. We had submitters from all six continents, 25 different countries. We held a, a workshop where all the teams came and were able to present their algorithms. And that first round, after all the uh, specifications were posted online for people to evaluate on the code was posted, about 25 of those 69 schemes were either broken or pretty severely attacked. But after a year, we selected 26 of the most promising schemes to move on into the second round of evaluation and analysis. 
and we wrote a report to document our selection and explain why we made those decisions. The second round lasted about a year and a half, where we focused on those 26 themes. Uh, the cryptographic community and industry also did as well. They did a lot of research, a lot of experiments and benchmarks. There was another workshop. Again, more schemes were broken and attacked. And at the end of the second round, we selected 15 algorithms to move on into the third round. This included seven finalists and eight alternates that still represented the different mathematical diversity of ideas that had been in place since the beginning. A the workshop, lots of research, and finally, in July of 2022, we selected the algorithms that we were going to choose for standardization. So these are the algorithms we selected. For key establishment or equivalent of public key encryption, we selected the Crystal's Kyber algorithm. And on the digital signature side, we selected Crystal's Dilithium, Falcon, and Sphinx Plus for standardization. And we have a report, Mr. 8413, it explains why we selected those schemes. Overall, we expect Kyber and Dilithium to be the main two algorithms that people use. They are based on structured lattices and have very good performance and should work for most applications. Falcon has a little bit smaller signatures, uh, more complex implementation. There are some trade-offs there. If you really need small signatures, Falcon might be a good option. And then Sphinx Plus is based on a different assumption hash based cryptography. It's, a, it's bigger and slower, but if you need a different security assumption than lattices, we have Sphinx Plus available as well. In addition to this, we have four algorithms, um, all CAMs, that were selected to advance on to a fourth round of evaluation. And we also are going to be giving a new process for digital signatures that I will talk about. So our timeline, this shows us where we've been and where we're going, where we are now. The third down ending, we selected algorithms for standardization. We're currently working on drafting those standards. We also have the fourth round of evaluation going on for the two of the algorithms. And we issued a new call for signatures. And so this kind of shows our future work as well. One thing to note is uh, draft standards we expect to have those ready um, in a few months, summer of 2023, and we expect the first PPC standards to be published in 2024. But for the chems in the fourth round, uh, three of them are based on codes. Um, they're still being studied. It's likely we'll select one or two of these at the end of the fourth round for standardization. Fourth round of them, site was broken um, almost a year ago, and we don't recommend that anybody use it. The submission team that agrees with that as well. Uh, coming up soon, on June 1st, we have a deadline for new signature schemes. We want these to complement the ones that we selected for standardization. Um, we're hoping to find a more general purpose digital signature scheme, not based on structured lattices, but that's more efficient than Sphinx Plus. Uh, Sphinx Plus is a little bit too big and slow for many applications. That's kind of the what we're looking for, although we might be interested in other properties. So after June 1st, um, this will begin a new process of looking at these algorithms. It will take many years to evaluate them, and possibly at the end we will select uh, some for standardization. We do not have a similar process for CAMS currently. We are writing the PPC standards as FIPS. Each of the algorithms will have their own document. It will include a complete specification for how to implement the algorithm. Um, there's many choices that need to be made. We don't expect a lot of changes from the round three specification. Uh, we've been discussing some of these on the PPC forum and at our workshop as well. But we definitely encourage you to provide feedback to us on any of the questions that we post on the PPC forum, or you can always email us directly as well. Um, there has been some IP considerations. We very much want these algorithms to be adopted, and we know that patents can sometimes hinder that. Um, for Crystal's Kyber, NIST made two license agreements with um, some holders of patents that potentially were related. And so we, we have uh, that posted on our website, information about those licenses, with the end result being, if you follow what's in our NIST PQC standards, then the license allows for royalty for use of implementations um, from those 
those families. And so that should help to relieve any concerns I have. A lot of the focus now is on the transition and the migration. Um, there's been a lot of discussion on using a hybrid mode. That's the idea where you combine a classical algorithm and a post quantum algorithm in such a way you have to break both to break your, your hybrid solution. That makes a lot of sense. Um, this will provide guidance on transitioning to PPC standards once we have the, the standards published. I also want to point out uh, our National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence has a, a very good project on the migration. <laughs> So if you want more information on transition and migration, that is a very good place to look as well. In conclusion, NIST is very grateful for all the work and the effort that people have been doing to help us with our standardization. We certainly welcome feedback. You can email us directly or you can engage with us on the PPC forum. That's where we use um, an online message board where we put announcements and there's a lot of discussion about standardization that goes on there. What we would reach the milestone of having standards very soon be here in 2024. There's still a lot of work to be done in the future as well. The fourth round going on, and we have the new call for signatures as well that we will invite people to evaluate. So once again, thank you again for your attention and the chance to provide this update. And I'm sorry I'm not there to take any questions, but you can uh, contact us and we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. So welcome back to the post-lunch session, the seventh session of our conclave. Our esteemed uh, panelists, dignitaries, who I'll be inviting on days, will be discussing and making presentations on quantum communication, industrial perspective, and use cases. Quantum communication is a secure method of transmitting information using quantum properties and it has potential applications in various sectors. The session will discuss use cases of quantum communication in the sectors such as defense, finance and telecom. Chairing the session will be Lieutenant General M. U. Nair, Signal Officer in Chief Indian Army. It's a pleasure and honor to have him here with us. May I please invite you sir on stage? Ati Vishisht Seva Medal, Sena Medal, Lieutenant General Nair was commissioned into the Corps of Signals of the Indian Army on 15th December 1984. He is a graduate of the National Defense Academy, Pune, and a postgraduate from the Defense Services Staff College, Wellington. He has vast experience in command and staff assignments and has served all over India. He has been the Chief Information Security Officer of the Ministry of Defense and of the Indian Armed Forces and has been responsible for protection of critical information infrastructure in defense domain as part of one of his responsibilities. He has represented the Indian Armed Forces at several meetings at national and international levels. He has been part of working groups on cybersecurity and technology related issues. He was instrumental in uh, raising of the Indian Defense Cyber Agency and subsequently headed the Signal Intelligence Directorate of the Indian Armed Forces. He has the rare distinction of being a Chief of Staff of an Operational Corps along Indian Northern Borders besides being a Chief of Staff of the Indian Army's Central Command at Lucknow. Let's give him a big round of applause. And now I would invite our other uh, distinguished panelists on uh, the days. Joining us is Dr. P. Syam Kumar from Institute of uh, Development and Research in Banking. <coughs> Dr. Dong Hee Sim from SK Telecom, South Korea. Shrianimesh Aryan, CEO of TACBIT Labs. Joining us also is Sri Dilip Singh, Chief Product Officer, QNU Labs. Sri Vikram Sharma, CEO of Quintessence Labs. And uh, Mr. Bruno Hutner, Director, ID Quantique.
over to the Honorable Chair. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. At the very outset, let me just thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to come and speak to you, all of you on uh, this domain of uh, quantum. Extremely grateful to you, <laughs> sirs, for calling, calling me over here. Uh, over the past two days, in fact, yesterday, I was only there for the inaugural session. Post that, I uh, left this venue. But I did follow up on the proceedings through the YouTube videos which are there. And everywhere, right from the first session, post the opening session, the first slide showed the applications of quantum domain is in the defense. So here I am actually, I think, the, the lone speaker in this entire uh, conclave speaking to you on how the users like me can actually benefit from whatever you are actually providing. So that's why I thought I'll speak to you. I'm also not going to get into the technology aspects of it, but I'll tell you that having run, having, uh, being responsible for a large communication network, which is pan-India, with uh, the entire army being uh, provided with communication support by me. I, I think we require a lot of support from each one of you, uh, the academicians, uh, the industry partners who can actually strengthen my uh, backbone. I'll come to that a little later. Uh, I'm, I'm also sure that you know, each one of you are aware of the importance the army, the armed forces have given to technology these days since the warfare has actually transcended to a new domain where uh, virtually uh, it's, it's operating on a technology domain. So you look at what's happening currently, the conflicts of today have intense presence of technology-aided tools, and that's where I think we are focusing at this point of time. Uh, I, have been, I have this habit of going through the magazines of recent times, and I came across an article in one of the, uh, the, the recent, uh, one of the weeklies which are there, and I found that the, the term quantum was associated with something called, it it's was called a spooky. So I think yesterday also somebody made a mention of it that you know it, it's still for us who have learned technology a few years back or few few decades back it's still something spooky. Uh, I leave it at that. Uh, progress in the field of science often comes from combining different ideas and approaches in seemingly unrelated fields. One of the most successful examples of this is the arena of quantum information, which has been evidently brought out in the ongoing conclave. The combination of information theory and quantum mechanics has led to a new and deep fundamental insight as well as idea into the new applications in computing and communication technologies. This is also significantly contributed to better understanding of various natural physics processes in the form of quantum information. New era of technology has only begun, which can lead to many unforeseen directions with immense potential and positive consequences and opportunities. Like any other development in technology domain, considering the vast array of inventions and advancements which have taken place over the past 100 years or so, and with an accelerated pace in recent years, one may conclude that quantum domain has immense potential in the field of military technology. Some may even define it as new domain of warfare, as Dr. Sumavagis had described yesterday that you know, we could consider quantum as a domain of warfare. She had mentioned quantum warfare. However, I would feel that it should be considered as an enabler for currently defined domains of military technology. It could be used to assist in protecting the military assets of a nation or for disrupting an adversary's military might. It could also be employed in an offensive manner where the technology is used to break, disrupt, or enable eavesdropping on classical secure systems. The quantum technology has immense opportunities in military domain. Computers based on quantum physics have the potential to solve military problems that would take a classical computer of modern era much longer. I'm sure all, all of you are aware of this. The huge computing power which will be available on our fingertips will be a major threat to classical secure systems of communication with both sit, uh, symmetric and asymmetric encryption systems being under grave threat. The way ahead would perhaps be to look for designing and developing quantum safe communication systems on fast track. As it emerged during the deliberations over the past two days, some key areas to focus on would be the domain of QKD based on principles of quantum physics and post-quantum cryptology based on classical physics. 
Both these fields have large number of use cases in the defense domains. Incidentally, the military networks may be more robust in terms of specifications, policies and procedures, and even network architecture and management. It would be a secure standalone network which is physically air-gapped, as in the case of our armed forces. And it may not be riding on a public service provider's backbone with no interference, uh, no uh, interference or connectivity to the internet. It will also be using multiple media, both wired and wireless. Now, I have listened to some of the speakers yesterday and some of the uh, deliberations which came up. Uh, Dr. Vardhya first mentioned, you know, he had mentioned about the various applications which are there and one of the applications, key applications which we could actually, you know, quantum computation and quantum communication are something which we could actually work on. We have been working very closely with the CDOT. Uh, the Q new lab, I think, uh, Sunil had actually mentioned about uh, hub and smoke model and point to point communication links. Now, we are at this point of time evaluating certain systems on point to point networks. We look forward to having trials, proof of concepts on hub and spoke model 2, where we can look at networks which we you know, with are strengthened through quantum safe methods. Uh, applications which were mentioned yesterday included GPS, which we have not looked at, at so far the atomic clock, which has immense significance for our networks. Uh, but an aspect which we probably uh, was discussed today was on the evaluation methodology for uh, strengthening the networks. You know, the as I mentioned, the military networks need to be absolutely robust and secure. That's where you know, we had to have an evaluation methodology as also some standards which need to be promulgated and which we need to be uh, verified. So this is something which is work in progress at, at this point of time. Some of the use cases, a quantum secure encryption system could be considered at device level, which could be provided layer three as quantum secure VPN or can be integrated for individual applications as an application layer. The existing TLS protocols may also be considered for possible upgrades on a quantum safe crypto suit. A possible fallout of emergence of quantum technology would be the replacement of the time-tested but resource and logistic in, in, you know, intensive physical movement of couriers for cipher key distribution. We have a process where the classical cipher keys are exchanged over distances through physical movement of couriers, which we actually want to get rid of at this point of time. You know, it, it's extremely uh, logistic heavy for us. A QQD solution can either be satellite or surface communication based between multiple headquarters and users in the field with the system of cipher couriers being completely replaced for transfer of keys. This is something we are actually keenly looking forward to at this point of time. Quantum safe encryptions using QQD solutions would be added benefit or development of QQD solutions with existing bulk encryption units being replaced by quantum safe encryptors. Additional benefits would be features such as QRNG capable capabilities, which if we reduce to chip level can be used in each device to further enhance security. I'm sure all of you would have seen what is available today in the current environment. Quantum secure VoIP phones, quantum secure video conference solutions, etc., are being discussed, evolved, evaluated, all of which have uses in the military domain. I'm sure some of this, the snapshots were given to you during yesterday's presentation. In one of my earlier assignments, we are working on a quantum secure Wi-Fi network to further enhance the security features of a campus-wide Wi-Fi system. It's still work in progress. Quantum technologies hold immense potential to revolutionize the design and management of protocols for communications and sensing and observation. Mankind's knowledge about the world and our technological advances are limited by what we can measure and how ac accurately we can do so. Researchers are also learning to use individual particles such as photons and electrons as sensors in measurement of force, gravity, electrical fields, etc. With quantum technology, the measuring power is pushed far beyond what's previously possible. As a nation, we have probably missed the bus in earlier years when far-reaching developments in ICT domain revolutionized the field of communication and networks as also in chip development. And this is despite our na nation's strength in the field of IT and software skills. Today, as the world is looking at a transition from a classical physics, physics domain to quantum physics domain, it's essential that we form part of this endeavor right from the beginning. 
investments and dedicated focus on the quantum domain can perhaps make our nation the leaders in the emerging fields of quantum technology with resultant benefits to us in the military who will also be part of any of the opportunities and endeavors at national level. We had made a recent entry into the domain by establishing a quantum lab at our Military College of Telecommunication Engineering at Mau near Indore and encouraging the trainee officers and men to carry out further research and development. The results have been promising, with over 10 small projects in the domain being undertaken by the officers and the trainees there. We will also look up to any developmental projects being undertaken by the Ministry of Communications where we can actively contribute with our military might. We have also recently implemented a quantum secure audio video stack, probably one of the first in the country, in one of our units with the support of some of the other government agencies. This is being integrated with our homegrown messenger ecosystem for use pan India and is in work in progress at this point of time. Uh, we are open to proof of concepts, trials, evaluations, both in our training facilities as also in field and in on operational networks too. So I would request any participants, you know, any members of the academia uh, industries, if you want to carry out any trials, evaluations, we are there to support you and our contacts, our contact persons are available right here. You can interact with them and we are ready to take on any trials on this particular domain on any field. As a person involved in provision of secure communication, quantum domain offers considerable capabilities. We are, we are assuring you of all support to the industry, the academia and the government agencies involved in the domain to freely interact with any members of my team as also the other services and take this effort forward to its logical conclusion. I would like to assure you that the Indian Army would be there to actively support any initiative and development in the quantum domain. Thank you very much and Jai Hind. Thank you so much, sir. I now request uh, Dr. P. Syam Kumar for his uh, keynote address. He'll be elucidating on the use cases in fintech sector. Dr. P. Sam Kumar is B.Tech, M.Tech and Ph.D. in Computer Science and Engineering and is having 12 years of teaching experience in different institutions. His research interests include cloud computing and security, virtualization and containers, edge for computing, cryptography and post-quantum cryptography. Dr. P. Sam Kumar, please. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. So now I'm presenting uh, idea bit developed one product uh, called QSAFE. So it is secure the uh, data uh, in the cloud and also secure on the quantum computers. Okay. So when you source data, we need to secure the data. So we developed one product called QSAFE. So let us start with introduction. So the <coughs> rapid development cloud, so banks tend to store their data in the cloud to reduce the cost and madness. But at the same time, since cloud is not trustworthy, the privacy of data may be compromised. So to protect the data privacy, the bank can prepare to encrypt the data before storing in the cloud. Okay, so the, once you encrypt the data and store in the cloud, so it will give the privacy of data. But you don't allow to search all the encrypted data, so whenever you want to get the particular record. So that means when <coughs> whenever you're storing under records, Whenever you want to get the particular record, so it, uh, simple encryption does not allow you. Okay, so one solution is we can download all documents and decrypt locally and search it and re-encrypt and upload, but it's not a practical solution for uh, many applications. So to perform search or encrypt data, so uh, public key searchable encryption is proposed. So it will for, uh, it will encrypt the data first and store in the cloud. So later it perform the search or encrypt data with the multiple keywords. Okay, so and also we know that uh, uh, traditional public key schemes designed based on the distributed authority problem and packeting problem. So these problems are vulnerable to quantum attacks. Hence, existing PK schemes no longer secure in the quantum era. And it is also not providing access control. So then we uh, proposed and developed a quantum safe. It is a quantum safe encrypted cloud storage. So using lattice based cryptography. So lattice based cryptography is one of the uh, promising post quantum cryptography due to its hard problems like uh, learning with error problem 
and shortage interview solution. So the key shape writes on attribute based sexual encryption from the lattice. That means we develop a attribute based sexual encryption uh, from the lattice and it provides the uh, privacy and access control for the uh, bank customer data in the cloud. The security of the key shape proved on the learning with problem. So we'll discuss what is learning with problem. So learning with problem is the solving of system uh, system of linear equation with the error terms. Okay. If the given error will b equal to a plus uh, e mod q. So our task is our task is find s by given a and b. Okay. So s is a secret and a and b is a public key. So it is difficult to find s by given a and b because if you want to find s, you should know the error term e. So e is generating from the Gaussian distribution. It does not reveal anything about the secret. So you can see below diagram. It is a lattice. Uh, what is a lattice? Is a, it is a uh, set of linear independent vectors. By given a random vector and asking to find a secret vector, it is a very difficult problem. So more precisely, if you have equation uh, a is equal b, it, it can easily be solved by using Gaussian elimination in a childhood problem. But it, this problem is very uh, difficult if you add a small lines to this problem. So so e is uh, generating coming from the Gaussian distribution. It's a random term every term. So if you want to find secret S, you should know the A. And again, LW is coming in the two terms, such version and uh, uh, decision version. The such version is by given A and, a and you need to find this. And decision version is, it is difficult to distinguish from the, the sample is coming from uniform or uniform distribution. So the key shape architecture contains four entities. So uh, trust, TA, trust authority, uh, data owner and data users and cl cloud server. So TA is responsible for uh, generating public and private keys and uh, data owner who is the owner of the data, we encrypt the data using public key and send to uh, cloud server and later when after storing data in the cloud, the data user uh, is authorized to <coughs> he generate the search query based on some keywords and send to cloud server. Then cloud server will search for the, uh, uh, any documents, if any document match with the keywords, you will send that file back to the user. The user decrypt the data and access. So this is the overall process of QSubert. The QSub contains mainly six algorithms. So first one is setup algorithm. So it, gen it uh, this algorithm run by TA, it takes large security parameter and generate the pub master public and master secret key. And next is encryption algorithm. This algorithm run by data owner. So it take the uh, uh, set of files document same and set up keywords, the keywords which is extracting from the uh, document set. Next is P, P is a policy. Go to move that. Back. Okay. On a previous. Uh, Yeah, I, 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 ah, okay. So the P is a <laughs> policy which decides that where the people can access the data um, uh, from the cloud, then public. Then after uh, encrypt the data and outsource to cloud, the cipher test contains two things. One is a cipher test of the documents and cipher of the index. Then key generation algorithm is generated, uh, uh, executed by TA. It generates the private key, uh, secret key for the data users based on his attributes. Here, uh, every user has the, their own secret key. Then trapdoor, uh, whenever user want to get a particular file, you will generate the trapdoor based on selective keywords and send to cloud server. Then <coughs> search algorithm is executed by cloud server by taking input of separate test and trapdoor. So if any file match with the trapdoor, you will send back that file to the user. So finally, user decrypt the data with the secret key. So these are the six algorithm piece of content. So what is the uh, overall process of QSAF is, it mainly contains two phases, setup phase and retrieval phase. In setup phase, which happened before sending data to cloud, and retrieval phase will happen after storing data in the cloud. So before storing data in cloud, what you're doing is, first we are building the index by extracting the keywords from the documents. Then after building index, we encrypt in the both documents and index and store in the cloud. So later, whenever you, uh, author user want to retrieve the particular file, so you will uh, uh, select the some uh, keywords and based on the keywords, you'll generate the search query. The search query will send to cloud server. Then cloud server will, will search on the encrypted index for the matching files. If any matching files will, uh, if any file match with the keywords, 
the particular file sent back to the user. Okay. So this is uh, what we are storing data in the encrypted form and also getting the data, uh, data back in the set of the encrypted data. So what the key safe object is? So main object of QSAF is to protect the data price in the cloud. So since uh, data is stored in the encrypted form and also retrieving based on the set or encrypted data, so there is no way for another user to access the data in the cloud. Now SkiSafe also provides fine gain access control. So since we encrypted, uh, we developed this one is RTPD based searchable encryption. So RTPD based encryption is a one to many encryption. So with the one public and uh, many private keys. So it will allow, allows only other users to access the data from cloud and restrict the another users from access the data. Next is the QSAFE is secured. The security of QSAFE is proved on the learning with problem, which receives the quantum attacks and also provide the long term security. And it is both secured on the classical computer and also quantum computers. And QSAFE is efficient. So this QSAFE is uh, uh, designed based on the lattice control copy. It does not require any pairing, uh, heavy pairing operation, which was there in the traditional schemes. So that is efficient than existing schemes. Summary, so IDIBT developed a QCA product to protect the data privacy in the cloud and also secure on the quantum computers. So bank can use this QCA product to store data in the cloud and also return the data without disclosing any information. So we are giving this product to banks as a POS. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Thank you so much. Uh, our next keynote speaker is Dr. Dong Hee Sim. He's been actively involved in global standardization activities for more than 15 years, including 3GPP, OMA, IEEE, HC, and ITUT. For the last 11 years, he's been with the SK Telecom, out of which for the last five years, he's been leading activities for the global standards and ecosystem development for quantum technology at SK Telecom. Dr. Dong Hee Sim. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, actually, my name is Dong Hee Sim. Uh, she asked me uh, how she should call me Dong Hee Dong Hai, but both is okay because some people call me Dong Hai. I think it's a very welcoming name, so you can call me Dong Hai too. So it's obviously a difficult name to pronounce because I'm the only uh, Korean in this room, a, a bit uh, strange, <coughs> but I'm very happy to be here because uh, to be honest with you, when I was invited to uh, this event to give a talk, I, I was a bit uh, um, curious, also a bit surprised because India quantum. So, but when I heard the old presentation made yesterday and today, I was really uh, surprised and impressed by all your achievements. So, really, congratulations to your achievements, actually. So, thank you. Uh, also, thank you uh, for the uh, special thanks to the all the uh, organizers and the, uh, you know, so the hospitality, etc. Also, the uh, people the behind the scene uh, is really hard work for them, especially our tool and the rocket too. So, my talk is about the quantum safe communication infra in SK Telecom. Basically, it's how what we have achieved so far. Um, so, let's see that. So, everybody's talking about this button. So, I hope this. Is <laughs> Which one? This one? Yeah, yeah, I did. Ah, ah, oh, sorry. Ah, oh, too much. Uh, uh, uh. It's okay. Um, so, uh, because I'm here today, uh, so I will talk about briefly what has been achieved so far in SK Telecom side. Uh, so, from 2011, we established our own quantum lab, actually. So to build up uh, QKD devices. So in 2014, we uh, developed the first uh, QKD device um, on, uh, on, by own. And then we uh, tried to build the QKD network in LTE 2016. And then during the collaboration, uh, I mean, during the development of these QKD devices and QKD network, and we heavily collaborated with the ID Quantic from Switzerland. So we decided to invest uh, to them, ID Quantic. So uh, we actually now majority shareholder at the moment. And then we try to build up QRNG applications. And then we also deploy the QKD network for the R5G. 
So we use QKD uh, for our network and also we uh, put the QRNG into our 5G authentication server too. And after that, we collaborate with the Samsung uh, to put QRNG. You may probably saw the, the QRNG chipset in the ID Quantity booth. So we put that ID Quantity uh, QRNG chip into uh, the Samsung mobile phone. We developed already three mo um, models already. Now we are working on the quantum sensing at the moment. So it's been uh, over 10 years. Uh, journey for the quantum technologies. So I'd say that we are maybe the uh, most advanced operator in the world uh, for the quantum technology, especially QKD and QRNG. Huh. Okay, so now talk about the our LT 5G backbone. So this is the, our first attempt uh, for the QKD, um, which is the point to point actually. So this is southern part of South Korea. So in 2016, we uh, tried to uh, put QKD devices developed by ourselves to put our uh, to put them in our LTE network and back home. So there's two cities in uh, in in southern uh, South Korea. So uh, I guess the, the the distance between two, two cities was 50 kilometers. So we uh, developed the, uh, put the QKD devices in, in that the LTE backhaul. That was our first attempt to to try to QKD network. That was point to point actually. And then for the 5G uh, in 2019, if I remember correctly, we uh, tried to continue to do, to put the QKD devices in, into our 5G backbone. So if you look at the left figure, that is Korean Peninsula. So if you look at the three dots over there, there is our main switching center for the 5G backbone. And then you can see the three cities there, Songsu and Dunsan and Tapyang. This is name of the, uh, the area in South Korea. And then you can see the big, uh, uh, the, um, this is a laser, I guess. This is, no, I'm laser, this one. Okay, so you can see this 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 big uh, the switching center over there, Sangsu, Dunsan, and Taepyeong, and then we put them the three tr uh, trusted nodes between two, and then two uh, trusted nodes between them. So it, between two uh, three switching center that was 221 kilometer, and then between two there's 109 kilometers. Totally, it's about 303 kilometers, which are covered by our QKD devices. So we basically use a trusted node concept. Uh, we heavily collaborate with Quantic, uh, and then we use them uh, the their devices to protect our backbone. So this is our, our basic use case to protect our backbone, uh, to protect our data for the customers. So that was the I guess the first attempt for the biology backbone uh, in the world, I guess. And during the process, as an operator, uh, it is extremely important for us to, to control and manage our network equipment. So everybody talking about QRNG, QKD, and PQC at today and yesterday. But I think that you have to remember that the QKD, maybe it is very QKD-centric and QRNG-centric, PQC-centric. But if you want to use them properly in the current network, you have to also control and manage properly. So from our perspective as an operator, which is extremely important, so we uh, try to uh, control our QKD devices properly, uh, not manually, which is expensive. So we have to develop our own platform to manage them. So you can imagine we have our optical network, which we use the actually SDN uh, as software defined network concept to properly control and manage them and the, but for the QKD part you also we developed our uh, SDN for to, to control both them and you need to synchronize both them to the optical part and then as the QKD part and then we developed a platform to control and manage both network at the same time and then we went to ETSI which is European standardization uh, organization but it's also global like ITUT so we uh, tried to develop the new standard for the uh, uh, SDN uh, the uh, interface to control both network at the same time so which was already published by uh, I mean, we made an effort to, for that. So this is very centralized control for the QKD, which is quite uh, convenient for us to control the network equipment as, as Q, QKD network as treat them as, as one of the QKD devices, I mean, network devices uh, in our network. So you think that this is extremely important to be used properly in the commercial network. You have to remember uh, it's not all about QKD. You have to have other mechanisms to control and manage uh, if you want to uh, really uh, control and manage properly in your network actually. So uh, 
that is QKD part, but for QRNG part, we also try to use QRNG as demonstrated by Bruno and many other uh, colleagues today. And we actually, uh, if you are familiar with the LTE and 5G uh, specification, you have to have a random number to authenticate uh, your users. There is authentication vector and there are four parameters in it. And one of them is random number. So you have to put the random numbers in it. So you have to have your own authentication server. And then we try to use the QRNG instead of the current available, the RNG to, to authenticate our users. So we use the uh, RD Quantic uh, QRNG appliances to, to put them into our authentication server. And then, as I said before, we collaborate with the Samsung mobiles to put the QRNG chipset into the mobile. So it's like a vice versa. It's in both directions. We try to use quantum technologies as much as possible. So this is another attempt. It's not uh, to try to protect our, our network. This is over the, uh, there are use cases for the vertical sectors. So you can see there is a power sector and finance sector. So NICE is kind of security, a credit and information company. So we try to collaborate with them, the power sector and the, also the security sector, uh, the finance sector, uh, what I'm saying, <coughs> to, to protect their data, uh, data uh, and headquarters, between headquarters and then their data center. So it's P2P actually, but we try to build up the vertical sector use cases to, to try to use uh, try to convince them to use QKD uh, as much as possible too. So this is another use case. And now uh, talking about the New Deal project, which is uh, funded by the Korean government as, as during the COVID time, they wanted to, uh, to have this kind of the uh, uh, project to, to, uh, uh, to as, as a stimulus package for the Korean uh, quantum safe infra. So it was done from 2022 at about three years, and the budget was about 2900, uh, 29 million euros. You know, is the uh, um, the, the exchange rate fluctuates uh, all the time, so it's about 29 uh, euros uh, according to the current uh, exchange rate. So if you uh, see this uh, this part. This actually, the first part is actually uh, the QKD part. So we, we collaborate uh, with the other operator to interconnect two QKD networks. So I will get into that uh, after this. And then this part, oh, sorry. Uh, I have to go back. Oh, Excuse me. So this part is actually tested for the other QKD protocols. So they uh, they develop the, the QKD devices in it, and then they really uh, try to various protocols in it to really test that. And oops. ah, sorry for my mistake. It's a bit. Uh, um, go back. Go back. It's the end of the conference. It's dying. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. So, and then the the last part in the uh, the uh, this part actually is for the PQC. So there are three task beds uh, funded by current government. So uh, the uh, the important part actually this one to to collaborate with the other operators to interconnect to QKD networks actually. So as I said, we developed our own QKD network, but we want to ex uh, extend our coverage uh, to collaborate with the other operators to to have a QKD network. So you you can imagine there is a border nodes between two uh, networks. So we developed the. Uh, the, our, the uh, collaborate with other operators to have a border node to interconnect to deliver the keys between two operators, which is also quite an important example. And so that's why uh, we uh, try to have inter-domain QKD control, which are currently are working on in Etsy side. We uh, tr uh, actually submitted the two new work items to, to, to uh, standardize uh, this kind of interface between two domains, two operators, which were already uh, accepted to, to work on actually, so in Etsy side, so which is based on also SDN uh, concept, uh, software defined, co defined control. So as I said before, the 18, the Etsy specification was about the controlling both optical part and QKD, but this is the QK, inter-domain QKD part between two uh, operators. So we heavily collaborate with the Telefonica and Deutsche Telekom in European operators and to, to define this interface. So we will do that uh, to publish this specification soon in Etsy site. 
So this is another uh, many examples for the vertical sectors. So it's also funded by government, not just by the QKD network. So you can see the health offices and water services and the, uh, the hospital and then also even factories. So they try to use QKD as much as possible to protect their, their own critical data, for example. So these many examples out there. So you can maybe uh, refer to that. Now, the uh, National Convergence Network, which interconnects all the government agencies in South Korea, uh, which I believe is one of the largest the government uh, QKD network. So, uh, I think the, uh, Bruno already presented slightly uh, yesterday, but this is the uh, Korean Convergence Network for the e-government. So, Korean government side wanted to interconnect all the 48 uh, uh, agencies in South Korea to, to interconnect, uh, firstly, broadband part, and then on top of that QKD. So, QKD actually covers 800 kilometers at the moment, I think which is the longest one for the government uh, QKD network. And then on top of that key management, so they basically three layers out there. It's broadband infrastructure and QKD and then key management. You, you can imagine how complex it is, but we heavily collaborated also ID Quantic to put them devices into our, uh, for the government, uh, the network. So we call it uh, Korean Convergence Network for the e-government, uh, which basically uh, behave as one big data center uh, for the government data. So which is, we are quite proud of it at the moment. So, uh, as an operator, I uh, explained to you many use cases. So we try to build up our the QKD taskbed at field test, etc. But also, as I said, it's not just all about QKD. We have to manage properly uh, to our network equipments uh, for the QKD devices too. So if you uh, uh, really want to build a QKD network, then you need to think about how to control and manage properly uh, uh, that one. Also, I guess it not, next maybe step is network architecture design. So uh, it, it, we currently think about the one domain particularly at the moment, one one company, maybe one government and, and one uh, you know university, etc. But if you want to extend the coverage, you have to think about interworking, interdomain, etc. So you need to think about this architecture perspective and design too. So maybe that is another uh, maybe to milestone to be achieved in the standardization too. So uh, everybody talking about P2P, QKD, it was done that, and then trusted node was uh, introduced and to build a QKD networks, but still silo pilots. And then uh, now we think about a multi-vendor even. So for example, if you want to have a multi-vendors, for example, as an operator, we normally use at least three vendors to, to deploy them. So, but currently <coughs> we are using ID Quantic, but if you want to have a Toshiba devices, for example, then you have to think about <coughs> multi-vendor uh, network to properly manage them, also how to interconnect them also. So as, as an operator, which is quite important, so you have to think about, maybe you now think about just one devices at the moment, but if you uh, really seriously think about QKD network, then you have to think about this multi-vendor concept too. So we are at this moment, at the moment, and at decided they're working on it, and then I just, that constantly said that the control and management is also important. As I said, interdomain, interoperator is now the topic at the moment. And then to build up quantum internet, make me think about quantum repeater and quantum routing, maybe it is in the future, I guess. So we, there are several stages. And then, uh, so we are actually at the third, in between two and third phases at the moment. So, uh, uh, we are really uh, have to have actually uh, as a next step uh, of talking to many operators, etc. But they have a different concept of key management on top of QKD network. So we have to synchronize and terminology and how to build up QKD, uh, the key management, etc. So to need to have standard for that maybe. And then modular building blocks and standardization interfaces for the, uh, the QKD network, maybe it's needed too. And then if you want to have a global network, then interoperability for carrier grade, interdomain, uh, it's really need to be emphasized. So uh, before going to uh, ending my talk, we need to talk about also the integration of the QKD in the operators network, I'm constantly emphasizing that. Also, we need to think about integrating QKD in the current increasing solutions, that is two pillars need to be attacked uh, in the future.
So thank you for your attention. So thank you. Thank you again <laughs> for the invitation. Thank you, sir. And coming up next is Sri Animesh Aryan. He's the founder, CEO of TagBit Labs. He founded TagBit Labs, a deep but tech startup focused on quantum communication technologies. TagBit Labs is uh, one of a uh, few companies in India to have worked with Ministry of Defense, Government of India. He has close to a decade of experience in quantum technologies and worked in reputed institutions like Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, RRI, etc. Sri Animesh Aryan. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I feel privileged to be standing here and addressing this August gathering. I thank organizers, uh, Kishore Babu sir, Abdul Kaim sir, for making this event such a phenomenal success because you have been able to do one Herculean task, which is bringing all the key stakeholders on a single platform. So, uh, uh, you know, thank you for you know giving us this opportunity. Uh, we are living in exciting times where new discoveries, especially in the quantum domain, are unfolding. Uh, new possibilities for a brighter future. Uh, the speakers before me have already addressed different aspects of QKD. Uh, in my presentation, I'll be focusing on applications of quantum technologies in general and QKD in our quantum secure communication specific. I hope uh, at the end of the presentation, you will be able to appreciate uh, the applications of quantum technology and uh, how it unfolds in the near future. So without further ado, uh, let me jump into my presentation. So, okay. Yeah. okay, just for the sake of you know, uh, this, uh, uh, our presentation, uh, let me define the four verticals which are important in defining any quantum technology that we talk about, uh, so which is being an umbrella term to define one or more of these technologies, which is quantum computing, quantum cryptography or uh, communication, quantum metrology, and quantum memory. And in all of these technologies, we have some, some of the properties of quantum physics in play. Among the four, quantum cryptography is the most mature and has been already you know, deployed in different parts of uh, the world. Right. Uh, to briefly talk about us, uh, we are uh, aspiring a uh, quantum communication startup and we have about 24 people in the team and we have a collective experience of about 100 plus, plus years in the field. Uh, from, you know, these are from different kinds of uh, reputed institutions from RRI to ISER Pune to IITs and also Max, uh, Max Institute. Uh, what we have been able to, what we do is that we use quantum technologies to build quantum enhanced solutions. In the quantum secure communication and quantum internet, we have products uh, while we do customized solutions in you know, imaging, sensing and also on algorithms. Uh, our capabilities are in both fiber-based QKD and free space QKD, as well as QRNGs. Whereas in case of quantum imaging and quantum algorithms, we are kind of you know early where we are trying to run and build some POCs. We also have uh, our own uh, entangled photon source, which is kind of a compact source for space applications. Uh, now, now this is one. Uh, interesting slide which talks about what kind of adoption we are looking at towards in quantum technology. So if you can look, majorly it is focused in US, Europe, China, India, South Korea, Japan. These are the pro prominent geographies uh, which are or likely to you know, look at adoption of quantum technologies. Uh, there are several reasons for that. You know, people are looking at using the quantum advantage in computing, something to you know, circumvent the adverse side effects of quantum computing, which I'll talk about. Right. There was one key thing which I probably I wanted to address was, you know, while discussing with many people, people think it's quantum versus classical. I believe it is not. It's uh, quantum is never going to replace classical computing. Classical computers are efficient to address most of the problems we have. Quantum computers on the other side are, uh, you know, better in solving, you know, problems like optimization or data analysis and some simulations which were, you know, not really possible using the classical computers. So this is how you know, quantum computers will exist along with the classical computers. And of course, these are able to address some core issues. And we will see what are the applications 
of QT. So uh, quantum technologies will almost affect every industry we can possibly, or you know, sector we can think of, right? From government, defense, healthcare, space, finance, telecom, and critical infra. I mean, one, one analogy probably which I can draw, about 40, 50 years ago, when laser was invented, nobody knew it could be used in fields like medical imaging and doing something basic scanning of barcodes to QR codes and fiber communication. Everything actually came into picture the moment, you know, laser was developed. I believe this is what quantum technology is going to unleash, where almost every sector, and these, I mean, we are only scratching the surface now, uh, where we see uh, applications of quantum computing in healthcare, where, you know, whatever you could do in terms of drug discovery and having five, six candidates, you know, run over trial for 10 years could be simulated on a quantum computer. And thus, you know, they can also try to do solve uh, optimization problems uh, to reduce the impact of transport in climate and almost every sector which relies on you know, cost efficient delivery to logistics, to manufacturing, everything which we think quantum computing will make it, at least it's a promise it will make it much more better. Right. Uh, the four uh, you know, things that we talked about, which is quantum uh, computing, quantum communication, and quantum memory and quantum uh, sensing, Quantum cryptography mostly came into picture because of the advent of quantum computing. So it was designed more as how to counter balance the uh, you know, development and the risk possessed by quantum computers, which we see that quantum computers uh, are becoming more powerful and therefore the threat of uh, quantum hacking cannot be ignored. So whatever data that we have today are either already compromised or at the verge of you know, being compromised. Obviously the first victims will be governments, banks, defense organizations and therefore you know it's, it's important to look at how to be safe in a post-quantum world we always think of you know whether it is too early or too late i believe that uh, you know the timelines for quantum computing uh, to be you know applicable in this context could be in few couple of years but the the harvesting which constantly happens is something that we have to worry about and uh, it's important that we, you know, we are prepared to be uh, you know, having quantum safe methods in place. So this is what the Y2Q problem is. And this is kind of an example of how uh, the conventional you know, cryptography works, which is actually not quantum safe, versus quantum crypto uh, cryptography or QKD, where we are able to take care of all the three things, which is right from the algorithm to the channel uh, to the key. Everything is secure in this aspect. Of course, it also has its own challenges in place. But what we see is that quantum secure communications has a variety of applications for, you know, strategic uh, uh, applications in defense, for, you know, military intelligence, for, you know, confidential projects. Whatever that we look at in terms of security is going to be, uh, you know, uh, crucial to prepare yourself in a post-quantum world. And therefore, we are not, we are talking about quantum proofing your data for tomorrow. That's, that's what, you know, quantum, quantum secure communication does. Uh, there are plenty of use cases, you know, as I think some of the use cases uh, the panelists before me have already highlighted. But this is mostly, you know, uh, focused on the bulk of the data which leaves and goes into the network and how to ensure that that data is safe against quantum computing attacks, right? These are into, you know, data centers, in telecom, in critical infra, you name it, you know, in, in passive optical networks. Everywhere that we look at, this is going to be very helpful. Right. Uh, in the near term, what we see is that we'll be using the fiber uh, connectivity in place uh, for applications in data centers, in uh, banks, in industry 4.0. The long term is when we will have a much more larger network of quantum satellites in place, which will exist with the terrestrial network. And this is going to be, uh, you know, uh, we would call as the step towards the quantum internet. Right. So that actually completed our applications in quantum secure communication. This is actually on quantum imaging and quantum sensing. So because of the advantage of a quantum, we should, uh, you know, we are able to look at something beyond the, you know, the diffraction limits. So we are looking at, you know, a, a medical imaging systems, which will be revolutionized using uh, quantum sources. Uh, we'll be able to also, you know, some of these application use cases have been already done by ID Quantic, which uh, to, you know, do a thorough imaging 
in a very dense and snowy uh, uh, atmosphere. Uh, these, some of these sensors, especially UK, is focused on quantum sensors for you know, diagnosis of heart-related uh, issues. Right. So now we are, you know, I mean, this is also on the global landscape of quantum secure communication. It's China, who is probably, I believe, is actually miles ahead. So which with about, you know, 5,000 kilometers of quantum network already in place for their, you know, strategic, uh, you know, communication. Uh, Japan also has, a, a, you know, a quantum metro area network in place. Uh, India, on the other side, has also, you know, joined the league. And we have also been able to demonstrate QKD uh, over a longer distance. I believe with the support of all the industry and academia uh, and the government, we should be able to build the future, which actually exploits the quantum technology and you know, un 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 unleashes the advantage. So yeah, that brings to the end of my slide. Thank you, Mr. Aryan. Well, uh, Dr. Bruno Hutner has contributed to three of our earlier sessions, and we look forward to his talk once again. He is the Director of Strategic Quantum Initiatives and a QKD expert at ID Quantique Geneva, Switzerland, and also the co chairman of uh, Quantum Save Working Group, organized by Cloud Security Alliance, an expert in quantum cryptography. Dr. Bruno Hutner. Okay, so one last time, I'm happy to be here uh, once more. Um, since we had a lot of many, many talks uh, until <laughs> now, um, and especially we had a whole session more, I mean, several talks on the post-quantum cryptography, I will really emphasize uh, the quantum thread to start with to give you a little bit of a different insight of how you can understand a quantum computer. So obviously I'm not going to explain everything in 12 minutes, I was told. Uh, but I will try my best to at least give you the flavor of a uh, quantum computer. So the quantum computer is basically working with qubits, and as we know, the main thing is that it's working with uh, superposition of states. And working this way, you ba it basically behaves as a massively parallel computer. And the way to see this, um, I think, is to make the comparison between a classical and a quantum computer. A classical computer, you can see, we take the model of a maze, okay? This is what I represent here. And the classical computer will try to explore the maze. So you start at the beginning, you make one step, and then another one, and another one. And in many instances, actually, a calculation is not deterministic. In many instances, you have a random choice which way you <coughs> want to go. When you have the fastest algorithms, they are never deterministic. But there is also cho always choices which you need to make on the way, which are random. So basically, classically, you start at one point, and you move through the maze each point at a time, and you arrive somewhere. And many times, it's not the right point, and therefore, you've got to start again. Okay? So that's a classical way to see uh, computation. What's happening when you have a quantum computer? As I told you, when you have a quantum computer, you don't make the choice, but you make a coherent superposition of the states. So you can see that as basically instead of going one way or another, the computer, the quantum computer will go all the way and explore in one go all the possible ve venues of this maze, go all around it, explore everything, and then when you measure will collapse. And obviously it can collapse anywhere, but then if you are clever, and you organize the interference between the paths you have in order, it's called quantum choreography. And if you organize that in a way that the probability is higher in one direction than another, then you have a good chance of reaching the end of the maze very, very much faster. Of course, it's not always the case, so you may have to do the calculation again and again, but normally after a few times, you reach the end of the maze. So that's, of course, I mean, uh, many uh, quantum computer scientists would probably jump at me at this time, but I think it gives you a flavor on the two main ingredients of the quantum computer here. It's really the coherent superposition of all the possibilities on the interference which you can manipulate in order to reach the right point. With that, of course we know that a quantum computer 
can give lots of opportunity, as we discussed before, and lots of threats. And of course, the main threat we see here is the threat to cybersecurity. So here, I'm not selling anything new. So I think you all know that, so we can go fast. Maybe I will even be faster than my 12 minutes. <laughs> um, so what's at risk, really? The main thing which is at risk today for cryptography is asymmetric crypto, as we know, because the quantum computer will break it. And as many of my colleagues say that, uh, told earlier, a big problem is encrypt now, decrypt later, which means that even if you have no quantum computer, you know that within a few years, few years, every data encrypted might be at risk. So let's go to solutions. And again, we've, we know what are the possible solutions. They go into two possible directions. One is classical. And the strange thing is that when you talk about post-quantum crypto, you have to realize, and many of my colleagues told that earlier, but repetition is never bad. Post-quantum crypto is totally classical, really. You use classical algorithm on classical computers, and you hope that they will, be, uh, they will resist the quantum computer. You need to choose the right mathematical problem, and you need to make sure that it's solid enough, both classically and quantum mechanically, to replace what we have today. The other direction you can go to find a good solution is, of course, quantum. I call it quantum versus quantum. And you use the very properties of quantum systems in order to manage the threat against the quantum computer. What we have today is quantum random number generator on QKD. And if you don't know what it is, I think you've lost your two days here. <laughs> <laughs> and in the future, uh, we hope to have full quantum networks where we can exchange qubit all around the world, I mean, locally first, and then all around the world, which is the quantum internet. So you see that quantum systems, quantum technologies are not totally developed yet, and that's why we are working to develop them uh, here. Different solutions for different needs. So that's really where I think uh, we start something a little bit more interesting than what I said today. You have very different crypto functions you need in a network. And each crypto function will be realized by one or another of the previous solutions. Randomness, I hope I convinced you that the best way to get randomness is really through quantum. It's very easy. Quantum mechanics is non-deterministic. You make a measurement, poof, you got randomness. That's the only way that is so easy to make. Authentication and signature on the other side, quantum mechanics for the moment have not proved itself at all on this one. If you need to authenticate yourself, today you use classical solutions. However, it doesn't mean you, need, you use only mathematical solutions. You got so-called uh, physically unclonable function, which could be physical solution to solve this problem, but they are also classical. So you see, not one solution for everything, you can mix them. Key exchange mechanism, this of course we have seen many, many times. You got both mathematics with post-quantum crypto and quantum key distribution uh, to realize that. Uh, this kind of function today. So again, both of them can be used. Encryption, for some reason, so far is really much better with mathematics. You very seldom use, try to use quantum mechanics to do encryption. I've seen a few examples uh, during this uh, uh, colloquium, this uh, uh, um, conclave, sorry, yeah. we had this discussion yesterday, it's still hard, but okay, so during the conclave we had a few uh, ideas, so maybe there are also quantum things to do to do encryption, but today let's say 99% of encryption is really do, done with maths. So you cannot really decide what is best. If you ask me what is best, I tell you depending on your use case, depending on the function you want to do, obviously one can be better than the other. I'm not going to read through this table. I just showed it to you. Maybe it will be available if uh, people want to see afterwards. But basically, this is the same table as I showed before, but with all the details to explain a bit more. So I will just take two cases. First one is authentication. And obviously, again, quantum key distribution does not address authentication. So there is no way you can authenticate Alice to Bob if you don't use something else. Today, for quantum key distribution, we mainly use pre-shared keys. We can also go to good post-quantum algorithm, 
we can do whatever we want, but we need an initial pre-shared keys. If Alice has never met Bob, there is no way she can know who it is. So the only way is either they share something in common or they, share, they trust somebody to give them something that they know will be in common. So somehow you need something to do that, and quantum cannot do it today. What quantum can do very well, QKD versus post quantum, is really time dependence. Today, any kind of mathematical solution for, for key distribution relies on computing, and we know that because the computing power is increasing all the time, because the algorithms improve all the time, the, the security of the uh, key, uh, key exchange is getting lower and lower with time. That's the standard way for all mathematical systems. And what happened with RSA and ECC is that suddenly there is a quantum computer and then the security will drop to zero. We didn't forecast that many, many years ago, but this is what's happening. What we do today is we put post-quantum crypto. There will be a decay, and we have seen that already. The parameters used today for post-quantum cryptographic algorithm, which are being discussed, have increased a lot since the first choice because people realize that it's not as safe as they thought for a given set of parameters. So you see that if you encrypt today, if you use post-quantum crypto today to exchange a key, the security will go down. For QKD, it's not the case. For QKD, if the if dropper can if drop, it's only at the time you exchange the key. There is nothing left afterwards. Either Eve has the key, and we hope that we know it, because that's what quantum mechanics is telling us, or Eve will never learn anything about the key, because there is no mathematics behind which hides the key. So I think if you want to exchange keys and keep them safe for a long time, QKD is definitely a good idea if you can use it. I don't think I need to go back to all this because it has been exchanged before. And we know the risk associated with post-quantum algorithm. What I would like to emphasize is that we have seen today many classical risks. We've seen many of the algorithms which were actually destroyed already, or at least the security has been degraded. Even Kyber security was degraded by an attack from an Israeli group, Matsov, who find a way to uh, basically destroy the first level of Kyber, with the others are still safe. But what would you know about the future, basically? What is more important, in my opinion, is the quantum risk. Today, we don't have a quantum computer which, can, uh, which we can use. I'm quite sure that the day we have quantum computers available to all of you, there will be some clever people who will find new algorithm because they will play with it. Before you play with a quantum computer, it's really theoretical. The time you have it in your hands, or you can access it over the internet, I'm sure that there will be many, many new al quantum algorithms, and one of them might be able to destroy what we call today post-quantum cryptography, and maybe we should change the name at some stage. And of course, I think it's interesting to always remember that we cannot really easily predict the future Okay, so something might happen which will destroy everything. And therefore, my message to you would be that whatever you do today, do not replace what you had, but add layers. That's why I called my talk the idea of the onion. Okay, if you have one layer and you add another layer and then another layer in such a way that to destroy the system, you need to destroy layer after layer, you can be reasonably sure that at least one of the layers will be okay. Do not mix different things within the same layer. Do not put QKD with PQC together, because then if by breaking PQC you break your QKD layer, it's no good, and the opposite applies. So build your security as an onion, okay? Do not chop it, <laughs> even though we want to make curry, maybe, but that's another story. So today, make the security as an onion, build it, use what you have, add a post-quantum layer, it cannot be bad, add a QKD layer whenever possible. And this way, we hope that we can withstand the threat of the quantum computers and maybe other threats we haven't discussed so far. And I think I'm almost, I'm at uh, 13 minutes. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure being here.
Thank you for being so precise. We know you're I'm from sweet. Switzerland. Yeah. <laughs> so now our next keynote speaker, Sri Dilip Singh, is the Chief Product and Technology Officer at QNU Labs. He's a pioneer in innovating, developing, and commercializing quantum communication products. He's been the leader in developing complete QKD products suite at QNU Labs. He has over 30 years of experience in the digital product engineering space across telecom, media platform, industrial IoT, datacom, and defense electronics. Sri Dilip Singh. So hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I know that it's post lunch, and I think tea is just outside. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll try to finish it off in 10 minutes. So uh, I will use this opportunity to actually uh, present uh, certain activities that we are doing at QNO, uh, especially focusing around free space QKD. So it's a it's a interesting area. Of course, we talked about uh, the terrestrial QKD, the QKD networks, and so on. And uh, and uh, but obviously, if we have to actually have a global coverage of uh, QKD and try to look at quantum internet or equivalent. Uh, free space liquidity is something which is absolutely important. So I take this opportunity to present uh, what's happening around worldwide. Uh, what is it that uh, are the key challenges when we actually have to build a free space uh, QKD system? And we'll talk about what is it that QNU is trying to do and uh, I'm also trying to hope and I'm hoping very seriously that we actually would uh, together as uh, with academia and some of the industry partners would uh, we can we can come together and actually try to uh, have this complete uh, solution for uh, uh, india which which actually we have been working on for quite some time uh, which we call as quantum shield for india so just start with that uh, so i think this is what uh, this uh, i think uh, probably the font could be a bit less but then this is what is actually happening worldwide so uh, on on a free space front uh, China actually is leading, so since 2016, I think they have deployed uh, um, satellites and they, have, they did proof of concept in 2016 and then they extended their network. We have some work happening in US and UK, which is already there. The rest of the countries, I think they are planning to have uh, satellites uh, in this year, later this year, early next year. So, so we, as we can see, we have work happening in Australia, the European Constitution is there. We have work happening in Canada as well as Germany. So there are multiple, uh, let's say, uh, proof of concept, technology demonstrations, and networks which actually are being created worldwide. Uh, and uh, we at QNU also are actually going going to towards in the same direction. Uh, if we if we try to understand uh, the whole uh, free space QKD uh, system, right? So, so it is not a very very easy thing. So, for example, if I if I have if I have to do let's say a ground station and I have to connect to a satellite. I don't want my ground station to connect to only one satellite, right? So I want my ground station to probably connect with as many satellites. I want my satellites also to connect to as many ground stations, right? Because they will be moving and, and I like to have that coverage. Then I want them to be basically operating continuously. I don't want to uh, lose uh, the key when let's say it is daytime or, or let's say when the environment is not so good and, and, uh, and because then it is not a reliable setup. So there are lots of expectations which, is, which basically we would like to have from a from a free space QKD system or a satellite based QKD system. So wherein we want it to be continuously operating with full reliability day in and day and day night and all sorts of permutations and combinations. But the reality is slightly different. The reality is that uh, it's single photon which actually have to c cross the atmospheric layer. There are lots of disturbances in the atmosphere. Uh, you can have rains, you can have storms, thunderstorms. And then you could have interference coming from the atmosphere, which actually is going to spoil your uh, receiver. So, so it, it's, it's not a very, very easy thing. The second thing is that because we actually operate at a very, very low power level. So the, most of the QKD technology, I think, operated minus 85 to minus 90 dB or so. So at that particular, that, that level of power, it is, it is very, very difficult to basically do switching. So for example, if you have one hub and you have three or four satellites crossing and you want to basically create all sorts of permutation combination, it is not so easy. Also because uh, when, when the satellite actually, when the ground station is able to see the satellite, it actually is at a distance of, uh, the horizon is probably, let's say, 1,000, 1,200 kilometers or 1,500 kilometers. So the more the distance, the lesser photons you receive and the lesser keys you will get. So the, the, the visibility to the actual satellite is when, let's say, you're at least looking at uh, plus 70 on each side. 
so the time duration wherein you get actually to, to generate a reasonable set of keys is is very very less right so that's that's a, that's a, that's a real uh, challenge also if you look at it uh, if unless we are there, let's say there, <coughs> there is a huge set of users and we have deployment uh, worldwide the the cost of operation is not very cheap right because let's say if you just want to connect three metro cities you actually would need at least two satellites and uh, three ground stations and and and, and maintain the, the an entire operation day and night so it's not very easy thing to do right the other challenging thing is that uh, if you, if you look at let's say uh, the the divergence that happens in the atmosphere right so let's say if you have a beam coming from from the satellite uh, the satellite is at 500 kilometers and uh, if you if you the moment it touches the atmosphere around which is around 20 25 kilometers it will start dispersing so uh, so you can imagine right you have you have an inverted uh, beaker right and you it's the beam is typically coming straight when it comes from the satellite the moment it hits the atmosphere it just just spreads like this so if it spreads then what happens is that the single photons basically get distributed over a very wide uh, area so if i talk about the technology for example today so isro has a technology to actually uh, have a the alignment of uh, let's say around 2 to 5 milli radians right which is which is probably a kilometer or more two kilometers if i talk about a leo satellite at 500 kilometers whereas if we have to have the uh, the the, uh, the free space satellite to be working we actually need a maximum dispersal of let's say 50 meters so we are talking about a technological change from let's say 2 to 5 milli radians so to to actually one to two micro radian which is a thousand time improvement on what is existing today so so that is basically i think uh, it talk about uh, the next slide what were the key challenges so i, I only talked about the, the the dispersion i talked about ground station challenges the cost of operation and uh, so so if i talk about the the, the the most significant problem or challenge that we have it is actually the aligning and pointing so india does not have the capability i think there are very few uh, uh, countries for uk probably had some china has it because they have done qkd because otherwise you don't need this type of alignment so we need to actually have a pointing and tracking system which actually should, would give me a alignment of one to two micro radii that is one the second thing is it's not just about uh, aligning it's actually keeping the alignment on when the satellite is moving so so you cannot move beyond that alignment because the moment if you look, if you move out of that then i think the whole uh, operation would work so now if you add the complexity of each ground station and satellite acting as a hub when i say hub it means the ground station is able to connect to multiple satellites would actually do the same thing then the the complete enormity of the uh, and complexity actually increases multifold so we at qnu basically we are trying to uh, work and solve some of the problems so this is what is the vision right that that uh, that we are talking about we hope that we will actually have our satellite uh, probably third quarter next year if i look at the graph right especially uh, with a focus on creating a quantum shield for india uh, minus the satellite we already have rest of the stuff we actually have the capability to to do point to point we have capability to do hub and spoke but india being let's say a, a pretty large country from distance perspective one end to other end is around 3000 kilometers or so with areas where let's see we only have forest and barren lands so that is where uh, we feel very strongly that uh, with the satellite coming in we can actually uh, make sure that we can do interconnect uh, across cities and then have local metro area networks in cities and then have a complete ecosystem wherein we would be actually able to create any sort of uh, network uh, india wide and of course if you deploy it uh, the satellites uh, outside and, uh, and we can actually do in a complete secure communi quantum secure communication worldwide so this is something which so this is a, this is one piece which uh, we are just working on uh, so as i said earlier right so there are three focus areas for us one it should work yeah, during the daytime as well so if we do just night time probably it's a challenge because if there is rain other shit you 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 not to be able to generate keys and all so we are trying to have a system which actually uh, works even during the day we had a proof of concept demo some time back and we can we 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 have made it operational even during daytime we are working on creating a very high precision pt the pointing and tracking system 
uh, we, we, we probably have an idea to do it, uh, to bring it down to 100 micro radians. But uh, we are working on uh, trying to see how do we get it 1 to 2 micro radian, which is a challenge. So I uh, would definitely like to invite uh, the academia and uh, industry partners to see if they can, uh, if they have the technology or, or they would like to work in this technology, we would be very happy uh, to collaborate on that. And then we basically have uh, done a very extensive uh, study on the atmospheric uh, conditions as to how do we compensate, what do we do and all of that. So we have, of course, the last one year, we have done lots and lots of simulations and all. And we reasonably understand, okay, what, what will it take to uh, uh, compensate and, and take care of some of those uh, things. So as we speak, I think uh, we should be having a two kilometer horizontal free space QKD probably another few weeks time frame. And the next step we want to do actually is to go to a drone-based QKD system. Because, so in the past, to going to the satellite so, uh, and then finally go to the satellite. So if I talk about this, the ultimate objective, right? this is what we are trying to look for. right? So we are trying to have a quantum secure space, air and, and uh, ground integrated quantum secure networks. So, so we only have the capability to do a complete uh, terrestrial or ground based uh, quantum secure network. Uh, the next path we are going to take is actually a drone based uh, security. So basically we would be able to go to the air so I can actually integrate ground and air, all resources and create a complete quantum secure network. And then, and this probably we should, we are planning to do it by end of this year. So probably end of this year, we should be able to create a very, very solid uh, ground to air, uh, uh, complete quantum secure network. And then uh, hopefully uh, by mid of next year, we'll also be able to do it on the satellite. So, so this basically completes the entire portfolio of creating a complete quantum secure network. Uh, and probably would help us uh, become, uh, help India become, let's say, uh, create a complete quantum secure network worldwide. And you know, our embassies or uh, our, uh, other infrastructure worldwide, even in India, can actually uh, communicate in a secure way. So this is what we are looking for and hoping that uh, probably end of next year. Let's see. <laughs> so this is an opportunity also now to start thinking but differently as well because, for example, as I think someone was saying that my laser were not there, it was not known. But when laser came, we figured out, okay, now you can use it for multiple purposes. So now if you could think of scenarios, you can think of drones being able to communicate securely, you able to think that, okay, you can, it is a possibility that you can actually create securely, for, communicate securely from any point to any point of the world. So now we can actually start thinking on certain use cases, which otherwise were very, very difficult and probably not possible. So we'll leave it with, with this thought. Uh, I think the idea is that uh, let's let's try to create a system. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Singh. I would now like to introduce uh, Sri Vikram Sharma. He founded and leads the Australian headquartered Quintessence Labs, which is at the forefront of the global quantum cybersecurity industry. The company's capabilities have received a number of recognitions, most recently being named Global Innovator by the World Economic Forum. Mr. Sharma serves on several industry boards and is a member of the World Economic Forum Global Future Council on Cybersecurity, the Wall Street Journal CEO Council, and the Forbes Technology Council. Mr. Vikram Sharma. Well, thank you very much for that uh, warm welcome. It's always a delight to be back here in Delhi. And thank you for your fortitude to make it through to the last session, uh, last address uh, of this uh, intense two days that we've had. And really, it's been uh, quite remarkable, the, the kind of exchanges that we've had. And it's wonderful to see senior representation from defense uh, and from government. Really gives you a lot of confidence. and. The uh, efforts of TSDSI, CDOT, uh, and uh, Tech in bringing us all together have been just incredible. Please join me in thanking them and congratulating them on a fantastic job. So, um, uh, I guess I don't know about you, but uh, after this sort of rich conversation that we've had over the last uh, couple of days, my head is certainly in a superposition of states. So uh, I'm not sure whether this, how the talk will go, but it might be a bit random. So <laughs> um, 
Well, with that, what I'd like to do in this uh, session is maybe try and pull together. You've heard a lot, and I think there's probably little that I can add to the tremendous discussions that we've had over the last two days, but see if we can try and pull together a few threads about uh, the various topics that you've heard about uh, in the last two days and uh, try and provide you a 50,000 foot view. Basically, try and pull together three things. Well, what is quantum? I think we've heard quite a lot about it. But let's see if we can summarize that in some way the cyber threat to it, and a little bit of a, maybe a, a, a short uh, approach that you can take towards being quantum safe. So let me see if I can get this to work. Ah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> so um, I don't think we'll uh, go through this in great detail, but as you have learned, quantum is a rather broad technology. You can slice and dice it in many different ways. Here's one potential way, so putting sensing and metrology in one bucket, computing in another, and then comms in a third. So sensing and metrology, as, as we've heard before, revolutionary changes, particularly if you're looking for, for example, minerals discovery, to be able to detect deposits that are just not possible with today's technology. From a military perspective, being able to find tunnels, for example, underground, that are just not detectable today. The possibility, maybe somewhere out into the future, to be able to turn the oceans transparent. Now, what does this mean for naval strategy? So some dramatic changes coming out, position, sensing, and timing. So when you're submerged for long periods of time, to be able to, in GPS, denied environments, to with great fidelity work out exactly where you are. That's a, not an easy problem, but one that quantum can help with. Computing, well, I won't belabor the point. You've heard so much about it problems which are intractable today, they just can't be solved, even with our best supercomputers, will be solvable by quantum computers. And as we've heard from colleagues, not all types of problems, probably what's likely you'll see is, for want of a better term, quantum accelerators coupled with conventional computers, but giving you speed up, dramatic speed up for certain classes of problems. But of course, for all the benefits that these quantum computers will offer us, they will threaten our cybersecurity, and we've heard so much about that through the last couple of days, so I, I won't belabor it, but the good news is, and uh, uh, really echoing Bruno's comments, we can use quantum to fight quantum. So there, there are some fantastic approaches which we've heard about where quantum technologies can be used to defeat the quantum threat. Um, Again, I think yesterday you would have seen from a couple of the speakers the scale of the investment that's going on last year. We had the opportunity to do some back-of-the-envelope calculations for a European agency. This was early last year. Please don't take these numbers as being precise, but I think they give you general trends. So uh, at that time, about 30 billion euros had been committed worldwide to the quantum sector. Uh, that's growing day on day, probably one year out now it might be 40 billion euros potentially. In fact, most recently, uh, you may have seen last week, the UK in their latest budget announced 2.5 billion pounds of funding for their quantum sector. But an interesting uh, couple of observations for this. One is that uh, China has really selected this as being a sector they would very much like to, to uh, uh, lead the world in. And uh, it, from our best estimates, about 40% of the global spend is coming out of China. The other interesting thing to point out is that private investment is starting to flow into, uh, into the quantum sector, largely until maybe a couple of years ago. Most of these initiatives were government funded. We're now starting to see private investment flow, I think because they start to see the commercial realities. Private investment is always driven by return on investment time frame. And now for some of the technologies, as you've heard from my colleagues, communications, sensing, uh, perhaps in the uh, uh, return realization period of the venture capitalists. I, again, I think that's probably the simplest way to say this. Quantum computers will break current encryption technologies very rapidly. So the small subline there is everything will need to be quantum resilient everywhere, borrowing from the recent uh, movie that won a few Oscars. Um, I think summarizing what some of the colleagues have talked about, so if we look at on the left-hand column here is you see four different cryptographic functions. The primary tools that are used today is in the second column, and what is the quantum attack and its impact on those. 
So if we look at digital uh, key exchange and digital signatures, so we primarily have RSA, Diffie-Hellman, elliptic curve, which are the basis of, uh, of assuring security of those, and using Shor's algorithm, which actually, interestingly enough, is almost 30 years old now. 30 years old. So I think Bruno was making the point here, what about the unknowns? What about new algorithms that we, we may discover or speed ups, as the Israelis have shown, uh, on existing algorithms? But the impact of this was they'll be broken. So hence, we need to move soon. Data encryption, well, if we look at symmetric ciphers, I think as you've again heard from colleagues, generally the idea is if you extend the key length, we think we will be okay, we think. Uh, and then authentication, so there's a, a guy called Simon and uh, using his algorithms, you uh, potentially can break some of the mechanisms we're using for authentication today. So what's the consequence? No comms link, will be trusted to be secure. No communication could be trusted to be authentic. You don't know who's on the end of the line. I mean, our e-commerce today relies on the fact, or secure comms, that I know who's on the other end of the line. It's not a, an imposter. And for e-commerce particularly, it means that transactions could be repudiated. I just say, no, I didn't buy this. It would be terrible for stocks particularly. So just to give you a little concrete example, so we talked about shores a lot, but what does it actually mean? So here's a very simple, simplified example of what asymmetric encryption looks like. So if I gave you two numbers, 165,181, and I said, please, can you multiply that with 417,953? Trust me, those are both prime numbers. Um, you could easily, on your calculator, punch that out, and within two seconds, you'll say, well, Vikram, the, the result is 69 million, 37, um, sorry, 69 billion, 37 million, etc. Easy, and those of us who are good mathematicians probably could do it on a piece of paper in a, in a matter of a few seconds. But if we want to, sorry, go the other way, and I gave you the 69 billion number, and I said, can you please tell me what are the two numbers I multiplied to get to this result, this product? That's a difficult problem. And that's the basis of asymmetric encryption. And as the numbers get bigger, the difficulty of reversing this multiplication scales very rapidly. Hence, uh, this is just an example that, um, and is perhaps a year or two old, if we add a 10, 24-bit semi-prime, so basically a number derived from the product of two primes, it would take us thousands of years on our best supercomputers today to try and factorize that. With a quantum computer and shorts, this would be done rapidly, in a matter of seconds or minutes. Therefore, public key exchange, asymmetric encryption, will no longer be safe. So, Michele Mosca yesterday gave a, a, a very informative address to us, because we often get asked the question, all right, well, what is the time frame we should act within? And that's a very difficult problem to ask, given that quantum computers are still developing, um, there are technical challenges to be encountered, and it's not an engineering problem, it's a scientific problem. Therefore, you can't put precise timelines around it. But he has a very good heuristic to think about the problem. It consists of three very simple variables, x, y, and z. x is the how long the encryption needs to be secure. Now, depending on the domain that you're operating in, the answer to that varies. It could be like a transactional data where it's seconds, and you don't care. After the transaction's done, you don't worry about the security of that information anymore. However, if we look at intellectual property, drug design, for example, financial secrets, healthcare data, military designs. These are things which we want to be absolutely secure today, but we want them to continue to be secure 10, 20, even in some cases 25 years. Interestingly enough, we had an example that came out of, I, I can't remember, I think it's one of the European countries, where they said citizens' healthcare data must be protected for their lifetime. If you look at the children that have been born, to, born today, they're easily going to live to 100. What does that tell you? That data needs to be secure for a hundred years. Why is how long it will take you to uh, retool your existing cybersecurity infrastructure? Totally non-trivial problem. If you think about how long it took us to get the infrastructure for public key infra uh, PKI installed, it was a decade or more. It's probably still going on, 20 years easily. So to roll out some of these systems, replace them with new technologies, easily five years for complex systems, if not more. And Z is your best guess of when a quantum computer would come out. And as Michele would say, if X plus Y is more than Z, that little bit where those secret keys are revealed, we've got a problem today, not in the future.
today. So he gives a very good idea. And as I said, we can't put a precise number on Z. So here is a very good heat map that he's put out. This is the latest one. It just came out, uh, uh, I think, about three months ago, December last year. And it gives a polling of people that have no vested interest in selling you uh, quantum secure equipment. These are people who are developing quantum computers. And it's their estimate of how long or the risk till you have somebody who within 24 hours can break 20 48-bit RSA encryption. Very precise question formulated here. And the way to look at it is, when does the risk level cross a threshold that you are comfortable with? Today in our businesses, in our military, uh, in our government affairs, things which are more than a 1% risk of occurring, we go to extraordinary lengths to protect ourselves against those. So you need to make your assessment that where does in this timeline the risk tolerance cross a threshold that you are comfortable with for the organization that you work with. And that can help you get a guidance on Z. For many large organizations, governments, defense organizations that we're talking to today, it's somewhere between seven and 10 years is, is where they think that Z might be. Um, a little bit about our company. We uh, were Australia's first uh, quantum cybersecurity company and after our friends at ID Quantique, one of the uh, very first uh, in, in the world. We've been going for about 14 years, arguably a little bit too early uh, to, to the party. Uh, but today we have quite a mature set of products which are deployed globally. Uh, some of the sectors, you can see banking and financial services. Uh, somebody thought yesterday, I think, talked about if you love your data. So these are the sectors that love their data. Banking, financial services, government, defense, um, defense primes, critical infrastructure, cloud, uh, Internet of Things. Um, so those are the areas where we are focused on as a company today. There are four pillars we think that you need to adopt to have a quantum resilient posture. True random number generation, you've heard a lot about that. Uh, enterprise scale key management. This is the critical piece that delivers you crypto agility. You need to support today's ciphers, all the ciphers which are so embedded in everything we do today. but. You need the ability as early as possible and as smoothly as possible to transition to PQC as, it's, uh, as it becomes standardized. And that's the third column there is PQC. So keep a watching brief on that. NIST has announced the first four uh, recommended algorithms, but we think this is going to be a rolling series of announcements. Over the next many years, you'll keep getting new announcements. So you need to have that agility to be able to adopt those new ciphers as they come out. At the moment, it's going to be a bit like Y2K. It's going to be really problematic. We have to look through all our code where it says, oh, I'm using AES. I need to change that out. But if you can do that in a crypto agile way, that pain of transition, you can take once and be set for the future. And the final piece is, of course, quantum secure communications using QKD. We do it a little differently to colleagues that have been speaking. As opposed to using single photons, we use bright lasers in their entirety. And uh, they have their pros and they have their cons, but happy to talk to any of you in detail about what we're doing in CVQKD, as it's known. Uh, this is a, a very quick uh, picture of some of what these products look like. On the left-hand side, that's a very fast random number generator. It puts out a billion random numbers per second. It's about the size of a cell phone, measures an effect called quantum tunneling. So it's all in, uh, all in electronics. In the center is our flagship product. We call this the TSF. This really has the capability to manage encryption keys at enormous scales. As we go to 5G, 6G, IoT, massively sensorized environments, you are going to find you're not going to just manage a few thousand or maybe tens of thousands of keys. You are going to soon be managing millions, if not hundreds of millions of keys. This provides you the capability. It works in massively clusterized uh, environments to give you enormous scale, redundancy, control. These are very hardened boxes, so very difficult to break into. And the final piece is our CVQKD. That's an old picture. It's down to a single 4RU uh, unit now. So finally, in closing, uh, perhaps just to share with you an approach that we think if you want to consider moving to a quantum resilient posture, what can you do? So the first thing is what we find with a lot of organizations is they actually don't even know across the large organization what types of cryptographic systems are in use. So it's very important to discover those and then classify and make an inventory and say, okay, this is all the cryptographic systems I hold. The second is what data do you hold? 
not known also by very many large organizations and particularly not all data is valuable. Probably I could even hazard a guess saying majority even in, in highly secure environments doesn't need high-end high-grade protection. But knowing what does need high-grade protection and identifying that and understanding the consequences of risk is absolutely critical. So once you've done that out of that, then you can work out which of those systems do you think are exposed to quantum risk and the consequences of compromise of that particular data. Because an important thing is as much as you protect, you must make sure that you have a very good response strategy in the event that you are breached, which is a very real risk today for most organizations. And then I think, and this is delightful to hear what Indian government and what defense is doing, is engage in these pilot programs and trials. So very important. Um, I think you see certain nation states have backed their programs very substantially. And it's an absolute pleasure to hear from all of you what India is doing in, the, in, this, in this regard. And then once you've done that, that gives you the ability to develop a transition roadmap. This is what you will be doing over the next five or ten years so that your critical systems become quantum resilient and particularly to adversaries who might have bad intentions you're very well protected and we just put out three or four steps there so that's one approach that you hopefully would find useful as you think about how you might move to quantum resilient posture so with that, um, I'm very excited, very delighted to have participated in um, this conference. Thank you for having me and uh, for India's quantum sector. I'm very excited to see its golden age now emerging. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sharma. Well, um, we hope that the takeaways from this session will um, enrich you. We would like to thank all our uh, distinguished panel for their uh, contributions, for bringing to the table their experience and expertise. And I now request uh, Sri Ritu Ranjan Mitharji, Senior DDG and Head TEC, to kindly present a memento to the Chair, Lieutenant General M. Onikrishnan Nair. And now I would request Honorable Chair to present mementos on behalf of GEC to all the panelists. Dr. P. Sam Kumar. Dr. Dong Hee Sim. Sri Animesh Aryan. Sri Dilip Singh, and uh, Sri Vikram Sharma. Thank you once again.